Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Geffen, Executive and Artistic Director for Cal Performances, and it is my huge honor to have with us today Mitsuko Uchida. Welcome, Mitsuko. Hi. Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> First of all, we are so grateful that you recorded this recital for us um, and that it is of repertoire that is so deeply personal and connected to you. Um, mm. I, I've had the the great privilege to hear your performance of the G major sonata, uh, I think three times. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Only, I, I, I have uh -huh. the feeling I'm it, playing it all the time, but I mean. <laughs> well, then, then I am guilty of not hearing it enough, but e each time has been a, a sort of a revelation. And it, it's, uh, it's a piece that goes to, um, a type of emotional rawness or uh, vulnerability that, that very few uh, pieces uh, dare to go. And I think yes, there, I were, think so. there, there were very few composers who felt, uh, who were able to yeah. translate this, uh, this duality um, that in fact, a duality not unlike the one that we are currently living in, in, in our isolation in the way of, of Schubert. So I wanted to, to ask you, first of all, about your, your relationship with Schubert and how it began. Yeah, well, it began all inconspicuously incon because I didn't even know uh, what that was. I liked a couple of songs. And because that was when I was a kid, but I, I grew up and up to virtually my 12th birthday, I was in Japan. And uh, um, I was um, the last kid of a uh, child of my parents. And I have a two year old, a uh, two years older brother who was a post-war child. And so I was the last one. I was an unnecessary last kid that my parents had. <laughs> it's true. And then, uh, um, and, the times were very different. I have never heard a full orchestra in Japan until I came to, uh, well, it's not true, once only, and until I came to Vienna. But that only time was probably I was nine. And the Italian opera had the first visit to Japan. And, and my father somehow was involved with, with uh, immigration and that sort of thing. And, and he got some invitation tickets. And as, as a uh, so civil servant, he's not allowed to get, uh, get uh, to receive gifts, right? And he was giving away everything except for two tickets. And those two tickets, he gave one ticket to my sister and on the other two, uh, the second ticket, I sat on uh, my mother's lap for the first half of Aida. And, and then halfway through, we switched father sat with brother for the second half. And that was the only time that I, in Japan, that I heard even an orchestra, let alone Verdi, uh, Aida, and then, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Giulietta Simeonato as a, a oh, Mary uh, shouting, Radames! And I was overawed. And I never thought that had anything to do with the plinky plonky, this and that, that I was playing. And I disliked the stuff that I played. Some pieces were beautiful, but it was not my choice by chance. And the people around me were so deeply unmusical. So, so that was my background, and but then my father was uh, in Germany a long time. He was a German specialist, as so uh, as it were. But he was he worked for the Foreign Office, and then he quit at the end of the war, and then he came back. And so uh, when he came back, was a time. Thank God that he was back, because otherwise I wouldn't have seen that Aida, you see. <laughs> and 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 um, and anyway, uh, so he was a German specialist, and he was really a good German speaker. And when I say so, believe me, because I think I, I, there are hardly any Japanese I have met who speaks really good German, but my father was one of the very few. And so he spent 10 years in Germany in the 1930s, and, the, and including the five years of war years. 
So, and and my mother and my oldest sister, they were already, uh, they, they were there, but they, they stayed in Japan. And, and in those years, um, particularly, I think in the in, in the the thirties, um, when he was in Berlin, and he loved the opera. He always loved the opera. He claimed to love music. No, he loved <laughs> opera, and he loved singing. He liked loved voice. So he was uh, he went often enough to the opera house, and and he was probably subscribing to the to the Berlin Philharmonic or something like that. He loved. Ultimately, he didn't like Wagner, but he liked, he loved Beethoven, and he uh, then, uh, but that's it, I think. <laughs> and anyway, and Mozart up to a point. And, and, and anyway, uh, and there was this record company, they were already then uh, quite aggressive. And they, they, they got hold of the, the list of the, the subscribers to the Philharmonic order to the Opera House or whatever. And they would send their new, uh, new recordings. There's, because they are, these are all the 78s. Mm -hmm. So they sent them to their home address and said, if you don't return it within three weeks, it is yours and you have to pay up. And my father, among other things, he was very bright, that I have to give him. Very complicated, but very bright. And he was the most, uh, the uh, laziest person, except for the brains, yeah? I mean, he's, he would see this microphone here and he wouldn't stretch his hand. He would call my mother and say, could you shift it by one centimeter, please? <laughs> yeah, that type. So for him to return those uh, the recordings, the records that arrived at his house, didn't cross his mind. So he came back to Japan with masses of recordings that he hasn't bought really, but somebody sent him. Yeah, and among them later, when on my when I was grown up enough, I found, for example, among them uh, the uh, the Schubert unfinished with Furtwängler. And, 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 but when I was a kid, I didn't know and nobody could read. And it was children's guess and instinct that we sort of played some, some stuff and it was uh, orchestra, we stopped. And, and among them, I heard some Schubert, but not really, and Schumann as well. And I remember one Mozart, das Veilchen, so beautifully sung. Uh, by uh, a Madame Onegin, Neja never heard. You know? mm -hmm. Beautiful singing, very free, very beautiful. And then Ich Grolle nicht Schumann, sung by Lotte Lehmann. Uh -huh. ah. so How, well, it is one of the most glorious uh, Ich Grolle nicht, I know. It's incredible. And so on. Among them was uh, this song that we liked sung by a, a vocal a male vocal quartet and we, we uh, and we kids called them and me and my brother we loved it so so we played it every day virtually and it's, it, uh, it went am brunnen vor dem tore da steht ein lindem baum dem baum wrong way round so it's adapted version of Lindenbaum from the Winterreise, which we never heard of uh, Lindenbaum. We didn't know what it was. Yeah? It was am Brunnen, as we said it. Yeah? So, am Brunnen vor dem Tore, da steht ein Lindenbaum. So, and so when I was 13 or so and heard the complete uh, Winterreise for the first time in Musikverein, Fischer Disco singing, Jena, uh, no, no, it was Jena. Uh, accompanying him, I think, actually very beautifully. And then came our song, slightly varied. I realized, aha, ours was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but so that was Schubert. And then I played some impromptus, or well, one impromptus, the fir first uh, uh, book, number two, E flat, and my mother kindly, although there was no money, the family had no money whatsoever, and yet she kindly bought me a recording uh, that was now an LP. Mm -hmm. And 
and played by unknown guys who that I did never heard of and uh, uh, called Schnabel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I must say, I loved the number one. That was very clear, yeah? And I didn't like the number two. So I, I asked my teacher, can I play number one, please? And she said, no, and that was it, that was the end. So, and so on, so, but I did love the, that C minor of that number one so much. Already then, I was probably eight or something. So I was a, an odd kid who actually loved that strange darkness and melancholy and not seeming to but actually that is a, that number two that I played when I played now it is so complex it's so complicated and it's so dark equally so and 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 then it went on and I came to Vienna and there was a lot um, and the Viennese think they know Schubert because, oh yeah, my grandfather, great-grandfather was went to a cafe and the, the France turned up and, and so on, yeah? Everybody knows every Viennese, oh, Beethoven, oh yeah, well, he was born somewhere in Bonn. Oh, no, 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 he became Beethoven because he, he lived in Vienna. So everybody is Viennese, virtually, and every great so-and-so is Viennese. But then I, um, I played a few other play, uh, pieces and I love some, but age 16, I heard Wilhelm Kempf play the G major sonata in a recital. And that was even in Japan. That was the first return to Japan after four years or so. And I was then playing the, studying the G major. And I sat in that concert and I, I knew Kempf's playing, active, whose playing I loved. Uh, there were things I didn't like, but because he had a way of uh, uh, technically, when it was loud, he banged. He was so bang, bang, yeah. And it was. Uh, but then he had amazing uh, lyricism and clarity and beauty. So I loved a lot of things. But that G major sonata was a dream from start to finish, and I still think it's one of the greatest uh, performances of of Kempf that I have heard. Or, or, or Schubert altogether, because I went later to his, uh, well, um, to his summer course in Positano, which, which he held of going through 32 Beethoven sonatas and five piano concerti in two weeks. And we, uh, and we were a group of 12, 12 or so people, a, a variety of, of uh, countries, variety of quality you know, of playing and everything. So, and we went, uh, chronologically through the Beethoven sonatas. And he would listen to everything. And then say, say you know, somebody plays it a horrible way. And I think, oh God, what is he going to say? And he would say, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then sit down and play one movement out of it. Truly beautifully, yeah? But it was his choice which bit he would want to play. He never played the Hammerklavier, but he was, uh, 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 but he played the most stunning second movement of the Opus 90, yeah, and so on. But when that was all over and we went very quickly through the whole thing and, and then the concerti and all that, and then there was a, a picnic and then the last uh, so farewell party with, uh, with uh, uh, home, uh, but the, the one thing that I remember is we always got a squeezed, freshly squeezed lemon from the garden, lemon juice. Oh, that was fantastic. But anyway, so that came to the, to the uh, farewell party and everybody played a little bit for fun. And there was a husband of somebody who, who sang and so on. Then without warning, he sat down and played the unfinished C major sonata, the reliquary that I so love. He just played it, and that was more beautiful than any Beethoven he played during those two weeks. So, uh, so uh, what I'm saying is probably, I loved Kempf's Schubert, and he brought Schubert closer to me, as well as my time in Vienna, because there is a lot of, say, uh, rhythm such as Lendler, yeah, uh, in the for, the, uh, the for example in the. Uh, the, the scatter of the, the G major sonata, the 
the uh, the trio. That's at a Lindla. So there is a rhythm that you you can't play it it isn't and that I don't need to think about and that is from years and years of Vienna and but did I love some people play Schubert in those uh, Viennese times not necessarily. So I discovered music sort of in fragments everywhere else in my life. Well, um, I, I remember actually walking through, through Vienna with you. Uh, this, mm -hmm. this was probably 20, 20 years ago. And um... maybe, yes, it is 20 odd years ago because I was recording my Schubert in, in Vienna. That's in Musik Verein, yes. And I smuggled you into the, the Imperial, no? You did. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just as importantly, you smuggled me into the Musik Verein so I could... Recording uh, session, yes, yeah. absolutely. I don't know which one was more important because to, to, uh, to stay in the Imperial for a cheap price, the yeah. arts were. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you pointing to uh, wh where the, the music store was, where you used to buy scores when you were, when yes. you were a student. And yeah. it, it, it's now something else. But it's clearly oh. a city that you have a great history with, uh, a personal oh, history. Yes. Oh, yes. And, and above all, um, as this is the city where I went to the opera so much, and particularly the first four years in some wonderful seats with my family. And father uh, uh, was uh, really generous to us all. So he took all the family to the opera house. And so he would spend a fortune, uh, sort of uh, buying the, all the tickets for the for the low, for the box seat, yeah. And so, of course, I was the smallest, so I was always in the back. But it doesn't matter. It, but it's it was wonderful. The operas I saw and and heard some singers, and most of them, the opera performances I went to were by Karajan, and I didn't like Karajan's Beethoven's, and I did not like his. Mozart either for, but I mean, I mean, I mean, I am saying these things that I shouldn't be saying, but it is true, and and then later also uh, Brahms symphonies. I have, I, I mean, I thought no, no, but come to operas from uh, Puccini to Verdi to even Wagner that I don't like, but he was wonderful and Strauss, Richard Strauss. Well, but even Johann Strauss, the Fledermaus, oh, wow. So, so those were the days with the, in, in the opera house. And of course, there was very mainstream uh, pro, uh, repertoire, but I didn't know any mainstream or uh, anything. So it was a revelation to me. What I find so interesting is that you, you then went on this, what now, um, I guess, young performers would say is the circuit of competitions, which yep. was, was different b back uh, back then. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, nay, they, uh, nothing changed with this sort of thing. It was ghastly then also, and and it was like a lottery anyway then. And, and um, because there was, I didn't know anything. I came from a non-musical background. And I didn't know how to how to start life, and nobody would be able to tell me. So that was the, the that was uh, very hard times. So that's why I'm quite uh, good to young people. To to uh, uh, I don't uh, as I don't teach, I don't meet that many people. But I still go to uh, I do I have been doing uh, or not doing being involved with Marlborough. And when, uh, so the Marlboro is not about being uh, the rehearsal and this and that, it's about eating together with everybody and gossiping together and from, and, uh, and, uh, and then hanging out. So, and when, when you hang out, uh, you can tell them what life is. 
Yeah? And I have had some, some kids crying on my shoulder. At, 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 I am nine, already 19, and then such and such who is 16 is having a big career. Oh, wow, uh, woo, 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 that sort of thing. And I say, you must be joking. You have yet nothing to say. So wait, <laughs> wait a bit. And if you have something to say, truly, then uh, the world will come to you. So it's very tough and you don't know, but you have to believe it because otherwise, what do we know? Well, I, I remember, I, I, and we will come back to Marlborough in, in a little bit, but I, I remember you saying to me uh, that prior to the, um, the Mozart Sonata project that, yes. that, that, you, that mm -hmm. you undertook, that mm -hmm. you, your career had, had not re yet really taken off. Mm. No. no. Actually, it was all very much the right timing, um, because when I was doing the Mozart, and I it was I was thinking which way do I do? Do I if this uh, this falls that way, I do Mozart. If it falls that way, I do Schubert complete sonatas. But I thought it was not as simple as that because I thought um, Schubert in uh, had been played by a number of people in London at least. And hardly anybody played, uh, even attempted to play some earlier Mozart. And, uh, and then even some, even some uh, very bright, fantastic colleagues of mine, well, I, I, don't, I don't name names, but said, oh, well, the, the early sonatas are so, so weak. And I looked at them and I looked out, and then I didn't play all of them, but yet, but I played a couple, I had three out of six early sonatas. And those were really bloody good, I thought. And I looked at the other ones too, uh, and I thought, I am gonna show them because it is so, the, it, the, the, even the early ones are so wonderful. So, and so that was Mozart. And I didn't know that around that time was to come, come that play Amadeus yeah. by Schaefer in, and that was in London. And for the big hit and suddenly everybody wanted Mozart. And then somebody from the from the record company, Philips, uh, 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 who actually wanted to record Schubert with me, Be uh, uh, that's on the strength of one record, a uh, bad badly recorded G major sonata the, of of Schubert, and he, that was Eric Smith, and he was the head of the ANR, and and Eric was, um, and he said he has the. The, the really he he's that he puts on a, a CD or whatever and there were no non CD days sort of it was a, a cassette tape he puts on and after ten seconds it's out and but most of them are ten seconds out and then he said he when he actually didn't throw out my G major and listened to it for thirty seven minutes six minutes or whatever he thought. God, what happened to me? There's something wrong. And listen to it again, he <laughs> said. And so he wanted actually to record Schubert with me. And then came Mozart. And when he, on the street corner, after one of the concerts, we went to an Italian, bad Italian restaurant in Soho. And then, and we came out and he said, well, I'm terribly sorry, but it's not, our recording is not going to be Schubert, but the first recording is going to be Mozart. And I asked him, well, are you uh, making me a recording offer? And he said, oh, yes. <laughs> so, so it started. And that was only because it was the, the Schaefer's Mozart came out and people were wild on Mozart. And then I recorded the Mozart and I found them so difficult to play and so difficult to record. And I still, but it's only in the last 15, 15 years that I can actually on stage playing Mozart, actually enjoy the unbelievable beauty and such joy in his music and such sorrow, all of that. I was so scared stiff because the music is so precise. And I thought mine is not good enough. So well, those were the days, but, but it started and with that recording and because it sold. So Eric came back to me and said, Sorry about this, but your recording is just selling so well. We can't stop that now, so we have to continue on Mozart. And so it, it came, so it went. Yeah, but yeah. The, the thing that I found most beautiful was you said that you were content making the music that that, that mattered to you. 
Um, that Ultimately, that is what it is. And um, because you can't depend on other people's opinion. And you have to believe in what you hear, what you want to hear. And it's all but what we have to say. But I, I, I always say we performers are the second rate musicians. The real first rate ones are the composers. They have written and they, that stays. And of course, many of the old manuscripts are gone and they got lost or somebody used it as a, it says a firewood and all sorts of things, awful things happened. But what is written is there. And that is what really matters. And what we do, we are just like the, the, the leaves in the autumn that fall. And once we are gone, we are gone and the next generation comes and plays. But the paper, that what's written on the, those dots on the paper, that stays, you see? And so, so we try, that's all what we are trying. Can, can I ask you about, about the first movement of the, of the Schubert G major? Because yeah. uh, it is, it's such an expansive piece yes. and um, it starts at a, well, you can't even tell when it begins sometimes if it's if, if, uh, the, the way that you play it you, it's it's so, uh, so soft it's it is pianissimo yes okay and and then yes it, it builds to i think the only fortissimo in uh in schubert's uh uh in in his writing um, oh no 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 there are he wrote F, uh, fffs uh, okay. i'm pretty sure but that has FFF in the development section, yeah. And it is extraordinary. And it is frightening. But it, but it is different yet from, say, the last three sonatas. Those, um, it is still more ambiguous about whether it is really that impossibly hopeless or not. It's so sad, but hopelessness is, is in Schubert's music anyway, but it still leaves you a, a leeway that it might mean something else as well. And, and I love that, that ambiguity in that piece. It's so moving. But it's differently moving compared to, say, that glorious uh, uh, the C minor or the A major that is so grand and the, the slow movement that is so completely hopeless, or the B flat, which is the most beautiful piece of music ever. And yet, it is that one it, is already beyond life or death. It is actually already on the other side. Now he has still another month and a bit to live, but that the Bifla Sonata I think is, is uh, if there is a farewell, total farewell, that piece is. Yeah. But at, at the, the point that the G major was written, he still, he still had life in him a little bit yeah a little bit left i sort of feel as if people knew with some composers i think they felt it but of course they don't know and and even schubert would have even hoped that he, he was even uh, in when he was writing those three uh, uh, sonatas he must have thought well maybe it's, it, it it can still continue his life but he lived more than five years five five and a half years at least with a knowledge, with a sword of Damocles hanging above his head. And he knew that death was here. Yeah. And because of, of, he was uh, having a bad syphilis and that was then a death sentence. And nobody knows where he picked it up, nor anything. That's not my business. I don't mind. But, uh, but what I love so much about Schubert probably is in, if he were an onion, you peel the onion. <laughs> he, he wasn't an onion, but if he, he were, you peel and peel and peel. And in the center, 
is an absolutely pure soul. And there are very few people in, in the history that's like that. For me, actually, Van Gogh, the painter, is that. Also, if he were on your new pin, in the center is the pure, pure soul. And so is the third one, is a, a, a name that uh, you may not know, uh, you might know, is uh, Tilman Riemenschneider. No, I don't know. No. And most, but, uh, well, Till Riemenschneider, if you happen to be in Cleveland in the museum, yeah, Cleveland Institute, they have a couple of Riemenschneiders. And I, he, he came from Würzburg and he was uh, the, the mayor of Würzburg at a given point. It is, and he died probably 1527, if I'm not wrong. So he was the German Renaissance man and he was, uh, he carved and he carved primarily linden wood and he's and he for me he's special because he could express the difference between humans and angels because it's difficult to describe what is an angel right what is an angel has a, 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 a the wings yeah and has feather feathery wings and fly around or what so what is it? And in when you see Riemenschneiders, angels, and humans next to each other, the humans are the ones who have lived. And that they, the living has also loving, but also suffering. And you can see that on his line, cheek line of Riemenschneider. I recognize his, his statues anywhere in the world. So you can go to Cleveland and then you'll see there is also an angel and there is also a human. Huh. And there's a wonderful, and when you go to, when you have the chance to go to Würzburg, ooh, there are oodles of them. So, uh, the, and for me, uh, although uh, when a German Renaissance and everybody knows uh, Dürer, and that is grand and that's great. I would, I, of course, uh, greatness of, Dura is extraordinary and I love him. But Riemenschneider has got that purity of, of soul. And so I love him so much. So oh. and should that Van Gogh Riemenschneider if they were on your side? <laughs> but it's interesting because the way you speak of them, you uh, on one hand you speak of the greatness of their work, but you you don't put them on a pedestal uh, as being gods. They, they, they were- No, they, no. They, they were humans, yeah. And the only one among the all of them, or no, that are, of course, but even that uh, amazing genius like Leo, Leonardo, mm -hmm. he was a real Renaissance man, thinker, everything. And that was a human being and amazing uh, painter and uh, Michelangelo, impossible, but still. And, but there is one artist called uh, Piero della Francesca that is slightly earlier. Uh, he, uh, he must have died around 1490 sometime. Uh, and, it, and his birthplace called uh, San Sepolcro. There, in, there is a resurrection and that resurrection is the only resurrection I have ever seen in my life. And you know, what does a resurrection mean? It's not that a beautiful young man is sitting there with a beard or the skinny and, and in, front, uh, <laughs> in front of the sarcophagus, uh, uh, there are three soldiers sleeping. Huh? That's not the point. The point is that the man who is standing there has been dead. And I don't know how he did it, uh, the Piero della Francesca, when uh, he painted it. But that one, the man that is standing, uh, he, he uh, is uh, in the in the, it, 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 on the, it's uh, uh, it's in the in a building. Uh, it's a sort of now uh, a museum, but it must have been a sort of town hall or something else. So, so that one. That man, if you look at his eyes, and he has been dead. And that is something so uniquely great. 
But do I love Piero more than Schubert and, than Riemenschneiders? And I, I tend to go to the, to the other ones. <laughs> I, but I mean, I'm not here to, to discuss about the Italian art or anything. No, it's, it, it, you it, can it, make comparisons, you know. Yeah, and and what I hear in what you're saying is that with uh, with with Schubert, he uh, the specter of death is always near. Um, <laughs> as he even as he's expressing some of his most most life affirming. Uh, types of uh, of music, yeah. you, there's always even, something on strong. Yeah, and even as a young man, look, if somebody's Opus One is Erlkönig, it uh, says something, yeah. right? So. <laughs> and I wanted to talk to you uh, about your relationship with um, with young musicians because you you. Uh, this may be something that our our audience knows less about is but you are one of the co-artistic directors of the Marlborough Festival and you mentioned mm -hmm. you mentioned this earlier but mm -hmm. that is a festival where there are no teachers and students there are but that is that is the official sort of uh, yeah slogan let's put yeah. it that way but, <laughs> <laughs> oh there no there no official teachers but uh, to say we, we are all uh, they used to say oh we are all democratic and then i would add immediately yeah oh but don't forget some are more democratic than some others. <laughs> because I don't want to sort of pretend to that everything is democratic. Of course, that is like a, a conductor has to be able to say, this is what I want. And also in, in as we are, uh, so when we rehearse, when, the point about Marlboro is that we, we are allotted together with young ones and old, old ones. So the juniors and then, then the, the seniors or oldies as we are called, and the oldies, uh, uh, in, in theory is more important and in theory also not important. And so it, it's, it's all slightly sort of, uh, 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 there is the ambiguity about it all, but ultimately what we, the, the, the oldies are doing is, but we have lived longer. And for us to lead the, the, the direction of that, that way to study together, way, the way to play together without saying, now you have got to do this. Nobody ought to be saying it has got to be done that. But so many teachers say that you are wrong. This this is such and such. No, and I used to think as a as a kid also, and Ben, particularly when I was 16, 17, 18, and and uh, I I used to think that my, my teacher would say, "Oh, this is that." I said, "I don't think so." I would say, <laughs> yeah, because how does he, there he know what Beethoven really would have wanted? Yeah. yeah, and I still think so. And with Mozart, it's the same. I look at the score again and again. I think I think it is so, but I may be wrong. That is the that is the starting point of a day, and that is the ending of the day of my my life. Well, um, you you're very convincing, um. <laughs> but it's true. But there are moments of, but particularly when I not when you are not on stage when you are playing at home, you can, you are allowed to play badly, and I love it because I can just enjoy music, what it is, and you discover every day something different. And maybe it is my strength that I must have a very short memory. So therefore, I can discover every day something new. And that is the real pleasure of life. And if, and if I'm, and, and I can do that day in, day out, every day in the pandemic, the people say, oh, it is so horrible life, it's so awful. I can't see my friends, I can't go out. I am saying, oh, well, I can stay at home. I can be playing on my beautiful pianos, but the stuff that I want to do to play and study, and I don't, I'm not under pressure for, in one week's time, I've got to play this. No, because exposure, when you are on stage, you, you, ha you have more responsibility towards a composer. And also, uh, um, also there is uh, vanity. You don't want to be playing that awfully badly. <laughs> a little bit, yes, but not 
terribly badly. So that is the real difficulty of uh, being exposed. So, uh, so, um, so the, the, to not to have the exposure that just living with music is wonderful. Well, and the way you describe it, um, the, your time at home is is a little bit like time in the laboratory, and your uh, yeah. your, your, your you you make experiments, and some of them don't work out. Uh, no, no. But then the bad ones are the one maybe that bring bring better results. But also, you know what it is. I was uh, telling a rather uh, uh, renowned, uh, rather a great colleague of mine, I, uh, well, people remain uh, nameless. Um, you know, I, I, I asked him, do you know why conductors live forever? And he said, no. I said, and they are so healthy. Uh, uh, but because they don't play themselves the wrong notes. They are just waving their uh, hands around and other people play wrong notes. And you can point out, ah, that was wrong. And that's so good. Yeah, don't you, have you noticed, I, I said to him, every wrong note you played on stage, that hurts. And he then uh, uh, said, agreed, yes, that is so true. And I said, that's why we get older. And then the conductors, they get, they just uh, uh, sort of go on and on healthy. <laughs> But I, I do want to, to, to turn back on this uh, because you have shown a great, uh, a great deal of responsibility to uh, younger generations and to bringing the interesting voices uh, of the younger generations yes. forward to helping them, not just yes. through Marlboro, but also through the Boletti Puitoni Trust. That is another wonderful organization which gives grants and, uh, and help towards young musicians who still do need need some help? Who are, have not been pushed as a, 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 a child, child prodigy, and the record company is running after them, and 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 all that. But there are so many of them who do deserve more help, and that I uh, I really try to 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 do uh, if possible. And both organizations, I, I'm very happy to say, and also proud to say, have been extremely good to young people. Um, uh, bo both, both of uh, Marlborough as well as, and, and young and older uh, musicians as well, because Boletti Buidoni has been uh, going for, by now, 18 years. And uh, Ilaria, it is basically Ilaria Boletti, uh, uh, her own money, she puts, she put, so much money uh, for towards young people, young musicians, and now it is half and half community uh, sort of projects and young musicians. But she has put a really a wonderful round sum for the young every winner of the 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 Bonetti Pitoni, uh, in the past eighteen years. If they are in trouble, they can ask for an extra stipend. I thought it's fantastic, no. And of course, then after that, and then the people have that, and you don't know how many people were in trouble. And the same thing applies also in Marlboro. And, and, and the, these two organizations have been absolutely wonderful to the, the people involved. So I feel so gratified to be involved with those, those people. Because the, the, you hear all the time the, the, that, uh, 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 Opera House has shut, and they then uh, uh, fire the orchestra. Boom! And that's what I th say, how can they do that? But of course, uh, for every survival, I'm pretty sure, but there might must be some, some ways of us surviving together. And I really hope that when this time is over, that we can reopen properly and then face the real new life and we don't know what is going to be looking at us but we have to be um to be really uh, we we have to particularly I, I mean musicians who are in a good position have to be helping 
well, you, you've been such a model of, uh, of that. Well, I'm not that good, but I, I, I do that under pressure only. <laughs> uh, you, you, you are too modest because I, I've, I've watched you with um, uh, in the, the two Schubert piano trios, uh, which I've heard you play in Marlboro. Uh, I heard- Wasn't that lovely? Yes, I, I enjoyed every bit of it, yes. Uh, with, uh, the, I remember the E flat with David Sawyer, the former cellist of the Guarneri Quartet, and then, um, and I think that was with Su Suvin Kim. That was, yes, that was a very special, very beautiful one, and then also another E flat was only uh, two years ago. That was with uh, Alexi and Kenny and 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 and, and the, the cellist, the, the, the Effe. Oh, F from the Philadelphia Orchestra. Yeah. And that was also a fantastically good, good time. And I still remember that the entire overall picture of the, the, the last E flat was something very special. But then the, with David and Subin, David's slow movement was so special and so beautiful. It was. Uh, it, it is. It's something unforgettable. Well, it's hard. When I was sitting in the hall listening to those performances, I I thought it, it, that it's impossible to um, to overstate the role that the, um, the diversity of thought uh, brings into those performances. That having having someone who having two individuals who have lived with these pieces for for decades. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and pairing them with someone who is coming, uh, you know, all sen all senses ready, um, uh, and 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 new new thoughts, really yeah. created something particularly beautiful. Yes, and actually, uh, the the reading session of Mozart Piano Concerti that started only something like eighteen nineteen years ago, not that. So it was one day, uh, one of. Uh, uh, Sort of, it was after 20, uh, the, this 21st century uh, hit. Um, uh, it was sort of uh, started by, by mistake, uh, as it were. But it, now we do it uh, regularly at the beginning of the, of, of the season. So it is a, it's for us to, get, uh, to meet with each other. And uh, so for, as in the olden days, it was uh, Richard Good and me, the directors. Now it is uh, Jonathan Biss and me. We both play one concerto, Mozart concerto each. And we have one session of two hours with the principal players to explain what, what we want. And that's it. And then everybody else comes in, everybody is sight reading. And you don't know how fantastic that sort of Mozart concerto can be. And, and it, it was, at first I thought it is so dicey, you know, it's not going to work, but it is, it is almost like, uh, well, one group that gives me that feeling is Mana Chamber Orchestra. They, uh, they play as if they, they were playing it just for the first time this time. Yeah? And that sort of uh, uh, youth, youthful psychology is there. And basically, me too, I have got it. I have got a risk, risk if it is, if I'm repeating what I have played yesterday, that's a total failure. So I have to jump. The moment you have to jump, you just jump and hope that you land with your both feet properly. Sometimes you don't, too bad. Well, um, I, I think we could probably talk for a, a very long time, uh, yeah. but I, I, I want to thank you for, for making the time to, to speak with me. Uh, and... Well, I talk so much junk. I'm sorry. I ought to be much more, more musically <laughs> interesting and then other details. And, oh, yeah, that piece is, is avoiding the tonic. And then the, the, but there are amazing pieces of how to avoid the tonic. Yeah? The, the two, uh, well, two pieces that are so... Uh, uh, so just obvious is though is Beethoven's 101 first movement. The entire first movement is avoiding the tonic. And it ends elusively 
inconclusively, and yet it doesn't feel strange and uncertain. It is just so mysterious. Yeah? The other one who emulated this is Schumann, the fantasy first movement. That is so openly, I am not going to hit tonic. I am not getting there. I am not, I am not, I am not. And at the very end, he then reaches the tonic and then <gasps> the world opens up. So, for example, or the uh, and so on. These are these are the the uh, you have to use then the musical jargons about that, yeah. Uh, but um, so I thought we are going to have that musical jargon co conversation. But it if this is good enough, it's fine. <laughs> it is more. Than, <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a pleasure, and um, and thank you so much for making this uh, this performance for us, which is oh well, that's what pure pleasure although it was not easy to be in the, to get there in an empty hall and then also the piano it is not mine and so on but here we are such is life yeah and but but jeremy i um, and i it's su such pleasure to be talking with you because uh, uh, because we got on from the word go you remember yes yes yep from, yeah from i think i am one of those i can claim i met you on your day one of your uh, your uh, your life as an administrator, no? You did, you did. Yeah, um, isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. So anyway, so that that's it. And uh, so stay well, and I hope everything goes well. And thank you for for also uh, letting me do this because I it was a pleasure to be thinking about you and playing it. Well, next time in Berkeley. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs>